Well, yeah, we've got a good number now, so I think I'll kick off. Um, so, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the webinar. Um, so for anybody that's uh, joining DPN webinars for the first time, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about us. So DPN, we're a, we're a UK-based um, data protection community and also consultancy, uh, working with a wide range of organisations uh, across many sectors and different geographies. Um, we also run bespoke uh, kind of training workshops um, and lots of practical guidance that we publish on our website as well for businesses. Um, so you'll find that on dpnetwork.org.uk if you'd like to have a look. So my name's Simon Blanchard. Um, I'm a partner at DPN. I've been working with personal data my entire career, really, um, including previous kind of marketing and commercial roles and digital roles before I moved into the data protection side nine years ago. So, um, yeah, work with advising all sorts of uh, businesses of all sorts of shapes and sizes and sectors. Um, I'm just going to pop the screens on and then I'll introduce you to uh, the panel that we've got with us. If you bear with me a second. There we go. Hopefully you can just see the slide then. So our topic today is tackling data breaches in six simple steps. Um, so which I'm sure you'll all agree um, is a you know, really important topic for businesses to really get a grip on nowadays. Um, so we are recording the webinar. I should just let you know. Um, if, so if you'd like to view it again, uh, you'll be you'll receive a link to the uh, to the webinar in about 24 hours time from now uh, in your email. So keep an eye out for that so you can watch it again if you want to or share it with colleagues. Um, I know that some of you have submitted questions in advance. In fact, quite a lot of you have shared a question in advance for the panel. So thanks very much for those. Um, but you do have the opportunity to share another question with the panel if you want to. You'll see that there's a button called chat um, where you can pop a question uh, to us. So my colleague Phil's going to be keeping an eye on those for us and keeping us honest with any questions that come in uh, over the next hour. So um, I'm just going to move on here and just do a quick intro to our, and a massive thank you um, to our uh, to DP Organizer, who's our sponsor today, our partner. Uh, so DP Organizer is a full suite privacy management solution that's all about giving privacy professionals everything they need to be more effective in their everyday work. Uh, it's an easy to use SaaS solution implemented in days and a professional services team of data protection lawyers will make sure you always have access to extra knowledge and resources. Uh, DP Organizer is hosted in and supported from Europe with a team of UK in the UK as well uh, and supports you with data mapping, risk assessments, workflow automation, e-learning, uh, data breaches and DSAR management and much more. So thanks very much uh, to our colleagues at uh, DP Organizer. So let's introduce you to the panel. Um, and first, I'm going to kick off by introducing to Robert Bond, uh, who's Senior Counsel uh, at Privacy Partnership. Um, Robert, do you want to say a couple of words just to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Simon. Thank you for having me on this webinar. Um, I've been dealing with data protection for just over 40 years and have dealt with quite a number of data incidents and reportable data breaches. Um, I'm a industry commissioner for the Data and Marketing Commission, and I'm also the data protection officer for four particular organizations. Wonderful. Thanks, Robert. Uh, also delighted to introduce Liz Smith as well, who's data protection consultant at DP Organizer. Hi, Simon. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the session. Thanks for having me here today. As Simon says, I'm Senior Data Protection and Customer Solutions Expert at DP Organizer. I'm incredibly passionate about data protection, particularly in making it fun. Wonderful. Thanks, Liz. Um, and David, um, David Jones is an Information Security Consultant at Full Frame Technology with some terrific experience. I'll let you uh, tell us more, Dave. Thanks, Simon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I, that's the first time I've heard da data protection and data breaches referred to as fun, but <laughs> as a CISO, possibly I have a slightly different view. Um, I've been in uh, data security uh, and information security for around about 20 years, um, uh, both as a CISO for uh, a number of uh, European and global uh, organizations, um, and as an interim CISO, um, working for, for short periods with companies who require assistance with strategy and um, change, change management. So um, I have some experience in the field, as they say. Uh, looking forward to very much to, to share some of that with you this afternoon. Brilliant. Thanks, David. It'd be good to have your specialist expertise on the panel for that. Um, so I'm just going to take you through just a quick kind of summary. Uh, it's only going to take a few moments, really, um, just to pick up, because we said that we talk about the six key steps 
uh, which is just illustrated here. So let's just move on and take you through them one by one. So first of all, um, what we're going to be talking about today is the planning process. So, so first of all, being able to recognise whether an incident is in fact a personal data breach or not, just a security incident. So a data incident, just as a reminder, is a security event which compromises the integrity, confidentiality or availability of data or an information asset. Uh, whereas a personal data breach is where the incident involves personal data, uh, which can either directly or indirectly identify the individuals. And we've got the uh, little clipping here from, uh, from the GDPR itself. So a breach of security leading to accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data either transmitted, stored, or otherwise processed. So actually from that definition, it's very broad, it takes into account a number of different situations. So that's what we're gonna be covering, I think, first in our, in our Q and A. Uh, we'll also look at kind of understanding the different types of data incident and breach that you may be subject to, um, deciding in advance who's going to be on your incident response team and what should that look like and developing then effective procedures so that you've got them all ready uh, for when a data breach occurs to not rushing around the last minute. Then we're gonna be looking at the area of uh, awareness and training. So making sure that people across the business are alert to the risks involved. So first thing, can people recognize a security incident or a data breach? Um, recognizing of course that around three and four of the, the data breaches that are reported to supervisor authorities like our ICO in the UK, are caused by human error, so referred to as non-cyber breaches. Um, so understand what does good training look like? Um, then we'll look at kind of do, you know, do people know what to do if they suspect a problem? And the key thing I think here is, is that we don't want people deciding for themselves if an event is serious or not. We need to have a reporting process so that, so that experts can look at it and decide if there's a data breach or not. So being very clear how that's reported within an organization. Then we'll look at the actual incident response uh, team itself and, and, and what, they're, what they're going to look like and what they're going to be doing, particularly the first 24 hours, 48 hours, maybe that are absolutely critical to uh, particularly in a data breach scenario. And we'll talk about how you might handle a data breach differently if you're a controller organization or if you're actually a processor on behalf of other organizations. We'll look at how you go about that kind of assessment, identifying and assessing what the risks actually look like for individuals and taking steps to tackle any immediate or kind of emerging risks that come out. We'll look at reporting uh, and notification. So first of all, keeping detailed records, making sure that you've got a log of everything and tracking everything as you go, because in the event of investigation afterwards, uh, that could prove absolutely vital. Um, you need to make a decision, of course, um, how, you know, if and how you need to report it to your supervisory authority. So, for example, the ICO in the UK, and then making the decision uh, should you notify it to any individuals whose data is affected as well. So we'll talk through that as well, I think, in the Q&A session. And then finally, um, the post-incident review, and making sure that we learn the learnings um, so that we can actually tackle any vulnerabilities or any issues that we've identified for a breach. Even the smallest breaches can identify a lot of learnings for us. And of course, we're gonna talk a bit about prevention as well today. Um, if we can prevent a breach in the first place or prevent an incident in the first place, then that's gotta be, uh, you know, that's gonna help even more. So um, that's all the slides. Um, we'll move quickly back on, back to the panel, and I'll hand over to Robert now to take us through the Q&A. Well, and just before we do that, could we do the poll? Let's do that. I shall just pop a poll on here. Here we go. You should be able to see it on your screens now. So the poll question for you all is, has your organization suffered one or more data breaches within the last 12 months? Quite a lot saying yes, actually. And I bet we're all delighted this is anonymous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think we're about there now. The percentage is not changing very much. So I'm just going to end the poll and we'll see the final figures. So 73, it fluctuates between sort of 73 and 75 percent. So nearly three quarters saying yes, we have suffered a data breach. 23 percent saying no and just a small number, three percent saying don't know. Good. OK, okay. Um, so let's move in. Um, we've got about 40, 
five minutes for quick Q and A, and um, in no particular order, one of the one of the questions we had was, can you clarify the difference between a data incident and a data breach, and when does it cross the line from one to another? Um, David, I'll start with you. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, the first thing to say is that uh, you should always refer to everything as data incident rather than data breach until you are absolutely convinced and absolutely sure that data, personal data has actually been compromised. Um, the key difference is really whether or not uh, the data which is being affected in your instant um, includes that PII data. Um, and that's, that's the fundamental. Um, there can be multiple data or security incidents which don't include any personal data. Um, but a breach is somewhere where A, um, it is the right kind of data, and B, you have evidence that it has been exfiltrated, uh, i.e. that people have seen it and have either taken it or copied it. Okay. And what do you say, Liz, from your point of view? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with what David says, but I think sometimes we have to read between the lines and we saw that with um, a breach, a charity breach. I think it was back in 2021 where it was the content of the email combined with the um, recipients of the email that led to the data breach. I'd rather not name the charity, it would be unfair for me to do so, but it is, you know, it is out there. And so you have to take a step back and look at it and think, if I were the data subject, how would I feel? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I'm going to I'm going to put this back to you again, Liz, that, that um, my experience as a DPO is that there, there still seems to be confusion in the organization and, you know, when things go wrong, what you don't want is a load of headless chickens running around all over the place, making the situation worse, turning the crisis into a disaster. So how do you, yep. how do you get that point across? I think for me, the first thing that we do is we have an open door culture so that people are not afraid to come and say, I've found this, I've seen this, or I've done that, this. And by having that open door culture, we can find out what's going on early on. Once we know what's going on, um, we can make those assessments. And having the right people in the right place at the right time is key. We need to know what we're going to do in those situations so we're not panicking. We've got a plan. We've got a, um, a procedure to follow. We've got a flow chart. We know who to involve at the right time. OK. And, and do you find, Simon, that um, in your experience, that's the right approach as Liz describes anything yeah, else you'd add absolutely yeah very much so I think the key thing is making sure that you have got exactly that kind of culture I agree with you Liz and a very clear reporting line so are people people got it top of mind uh, how do we go about reporting a breach you know do we do we raise it with the IT do we send it to the DPO depending who it is in your organization but having a clear reporting line for it and making sure that they're aware that they don't make the assessment themselves um, it's not their place to judge if something's a data breach or not. Flag it up, please. Let someone then uh, look at it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. People shouldn't be afraid to do that. They should very much feel like they're going to be listened to um, and that they've, you know, that it's it's very beneficial that the organisation has got an awareness of that because it's mm. something that's, you know, you might think is not serious, might turn out to be more serious than you think and vice versa, of course. Yeah, and... and crucial. T time, time is critical. I, I often say when I'm doing training internally, don't be embarrassed to admit you might have sent the right attachment to the wrong person or that you left your phone in a cab. Be embarrassed that you didn't tell somebody as yeah. soon as you should. I mean, do you agree, do you agree with that, David? Oh, absolutely. I think that, 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 that it's important to encourage people to feel that they're empowered to uh, warn you. And that uh, if people make a mistake, the first uh, response is not punishment. 
um, mm -hmm. in actual fact, it, it, it's congratulations because if someone makes a mistake and they tell you immediately, it gives you the maximum amount of time to be able to respond. Um, and very often things can be mitigated in minutes or hours, um, which if not reported to you, um, will typically re be reported back by your customer, your client, your contact. And that's when the pain really starts because yeah. you're already on the back foot. Yeah. So encouraging people to feel confident that they're not going to get, um, you know, career threatening responses uh, when they report a mistake and uh, when they report a suspicion is really essential. So um, there's a question just come in and um, uh, I'll start with I'll start with you again, David, on this one. Um, is it a breach if somebody shares personal information verbally with someone else, i.e. discusses a customer with someone else outside the workplace? Um, it would depend, I, I guess, really on, on the type of data which is being uh, discussed. But if that information, if the information that they're discussing has been provided to you as a company for business purposes, and it is then being discussed by an individual for personal matters, I would consider that to be a breach. Um, it would, you should then investigate to see how severe it is. Who is the person who's receiving the information and what might they do with it? How important is that or how personally impactful is that information and how badly would it be felt by the person whose data is being shared? Um, it is, it is a, a, a difficult one, but I would personally refer to that as an instant and look at investigating in particular to find out whether this is part of a pattern that the individual in, in that particular case is doing this regularly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes, I agree with you. I think it's an incident. It's, it's obviously a breach of confidentiality. Yeah. And it's yeah. probably a breach of other policies that you might have in place. What would, what would you say to that, Liz? Yeah, I agree. And it comes back to putting yourself in the shoes of the person being spoken about. How would you feel if I'd given you my information as a customer of yours and then I find you're talking to somebody about it? Um, and as David said, is this a pattern with that individual? Um, but I think we need to look at that in any situation. What are the circumstances around the individual? Is it a one off? Do they not realize? Are they a new member of staff? Are the organizational measures in place? Do they know the implications? Have they had their training? So as much as we can look at human error, we also need to look at the organizational implications and the organizational support for the individual staff member. Yeah, and anything you want to add to that one, Simon? You, the only thing I'd add, I totally agree with you both, uh, the only thing I'd add really is that considering the sensitivity as well as to whether the information that's being shared here is is you know sensitive in nature whether it includes any kind of thing special category data or any other sensitive information and of course bearing in mind it might not just be personal data that's affected it could be company confidential data business confidential or, or other things that can uh, that can be damaging to a business or damaging to others as well if we look outside the personal data breach space then those breaches of confidentiality can be can be more broad uh, they yeah. can still cause harm yeah and, and maybe just following on from that um one of the questions we've had is, um, should we only be concerned about breaches that involve personal data? And um, my, certainly my experience this year has been that what's been reported to me as the data protection officer as a breach um, it turns out that the least of our concerns is personal data. This is a nation state sponsored attack on a company that is in a high risk area where what's been stolen are plans of pipelines and the like, where it's quite clear that what is being sought is information uh, intellectual property, business confidential, trade secrets, whatever you call it. And yes, there's probably some personal data scooped up in amongst it. But when you look at what do we do first, 
it's probably not rushing off and thinking about telling the ICO. It's more about telling three-letter, four-letter agencies, etc. And I, and I guess, I guess, David, you'd say you come across those things as well, where it's not personal data; it's any other sort of data. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I mean, intellectual property um, is becoming increasingly sought after. Um, I think what, what's interesting is that. The, the, looking at some of the statistics behind the, the kind of attacks which we see and the kind of data which is stolen, um, increasingly uh, we're looking at data data being um, removed from your use through things like ransomware and so on. Um, that can be a real pickle when you're trying to decide whether or not there's been a data breach because you have to decide whether or not the attackers have actually seen the data or exfiltrated the data as opposed to purely putting it beyond your access. Um, the, the stats tell us that, that in 75% of all ransomware attacks, um, the data is also being stolen. So even though it might appear to be just a business interruption, um, it's actually data theft as well. Um, and so you get that kind of combination. Um, but it's certainly true that, that in many organizations, the, the work which they do, the personal information they have is purely their staffing and probably the contacts they have uh, through their business rather than holding large amounts of personal data. So for them, the data breach is um, commercial secrets um, and so on. So. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, I think from experience, and there's several questions on this same theme, and I'm going to ask Liz this one. Um, how do you manage a report where you know the law says if it's serious, you've got to report it within 72 hours of becoming aware of it, but how do you satisfy yourself as soon as you receive the report? whether or not there is any personal data impacted. Practically, what do you do? Ask questions, research, talk to people, find out what's going on. And this comes back to the culture. Um, as you can see, I'm quite passionate about the culture within an organization <laughs> to make it OK for people to tell you the facts, what's actually happened and not to be hiding things behind closed doors. Because if we start hiding things, then we're not going to do ourselves any favour at all. So it's having that open door policy to be able to unpack as you go along. Um, and as you find a strand, follow that strand. There is the, um, on the ICO website, there is the, um, like a toolkit, isn't there? A question, um, what do you call it? That you right. can follow to say, um, you know, has this happened? What about this? So you can use that as your basis. Um, that tool, but start talking to people. You can't make a decision in those situations alone. Okay, and there's a question again, Liz, that's come off one of your previous comments about the open culture. Uh, this individual says, I think everybody should report to me as the DPO, but a colleague has recently said, no, it should be rooted through IT and cybersecurity. Where do you stand on that? Um, and, then, and, then I'll, and then I'll come back to David. <laughs> uh, yes, great question. If I'm a DPO, then I want to know what's going on with the data. So I think it comes to me. And that comes back to the early conversation that we had about um, headless chickens. If it comes to me, I own it. I might then pass it to the cyber team, the IT team, but at least there is somebody controlling and managing the situation. There's somebody um, as a centre point. David? Um, I'm going to be very <laughs> diplomatic here um, and sit on the <laughs> fence. Um, it depends very much on the structure of the organisation and the size of the organisation. Um, in very many cases, DPOs tend to sit within cybersecurity cybersecurity sits within the same group as data, data protection. So it, it very often it's, it's kind of a, a distinction without a difference. Um, I think the most important thing is that there's a consistent way in which people can report. If you make it easy for people to report, have a, um, an intranet page, uh, an email address they can send to, a telephone number which they can call, um, so that 
whenever that happens, the correct information is captured at the outset. Whether it's the cybersecurity team reporting to the DPO or vice versa, they should be able to, the people who respond should be able to look at it very quickly and say, this is something which needs further investigation and the DPO needs to be clearly involved. Or um, this is something which doesn't appear to have any data, you know, personal data, so I'm not interested, but I need to give it to cybersecurity. Um, but having that consistency of reporting um, makes that an easy approach to take. Okay, so um, I'm going to. This next question nicely follows on from that. Um, who should be the team that deals with an incident? What do you think, Simon? Who's the team? So I'd say if yeah, if the organisation's got a DPO, they most certainly should be involved in that, or their nominated individual. It could be potentially, depending on the organisation. Um, I'd be looking again if they've got a CISO, uh, you know, some of the heads up the information security. I'd definitely be looking at having them on board too, that can manage kind of the more forensic stuff that kind of Dave's been picking up on, identifying whether there's personal data that's been that has actually been accessed or exfiltrated. Um, then they'll have the tools and capabilities and team to be able to do that kind of activity. Again, may need to call in third party experts too, depending on the business. Um, those are, are going to be the key people. But equally, the other thing that I tend to kind of bring on board where there's a situation like this is if there's um, a breach of a certain type of data. So let's imagine it's a breach affecting employee data. I'd want the head of HR involved as well, right. because they'll have yeah. a better understanding of what are the impacts on those individuals. Uh, obviously, you can bring those in at a later stage. You don't necessarily need them at the very first stage. You could bring them in at the stage you've identified. Yes, there is a personal data breach that affects employee data. Uh, sales data, marketing data, in which case you bring in the head of marketing, for example. So I think they're probably the key parts. Equally, you may have a separate legal director um, to the DPO, uh, you know, legal counsel, etc., cetera, um, who should, uh, should be considered on the team. Um, they would probably be the key roles that I would, would think of for that. And Liz, any thoughts? Uh, I agree with all of that. You can't have one team because breaches can happen across the business. You need to have people that you call on according to the situation. Um, probably somebody like the chief operating officer or chief exec, somebody at the higher level as well. Although DPO reports directly in, if we are facing a breach, I would want to be reporting it to them for communication purposes. And the comms team. Yeah. Is it necessary to be doing external comms? How big's the breach? Or is it something, if it's a, if it's um, staff data and a relatively small organisation, it's just what we tell the staff. However, if it's a big thing, do we need to tell our customers? Do we need to tell other people? Do we need to tell stakeholders? If we're a processor, do we need to tell our controllers? So um, you can't have one team when there's not a one size fits all. And could have Robert I think that's also yeah. reflected that for a larger organization you might have you might actually have an initial response team that yeah. are there to say right how is this actually a personal data breach is it a confidential data breach what what does it look like effectively and then would their responsibility would either escalate it up straight away but particularly to call on the appropriate people that need to be added to the team so that you can then triage effectively start the assessment in a more detailed assessment process yeah and I was about to say I mean I've I've always, when I've been drafting a policy, talked about having a rapid reaction task force. Yeah. So who are the people that are going to be on this one minute after it happens and one day after it happens? But then who else would you go to? And, and obviously, Liz, you talked about comms and so on. But I guess, you know, David might be saying, well, we also need to think about the forensics people to understand what's been accessed, et cetera, et cetera. And then you probably want external counsel as well for mm -hmm. lead privilege over what's being picked yeah. up. I mean, anything else you'd add to that, David? Um, I think in my experience, we, we've tended to look at this in a, in a kind of a three tier. So you have a technical response, um, which is normally guided by uh, the security team, uh, whoever's lead for DP and IT. Um, if it's a cyber event, um, maybe with, with facilities, if it's a physical event, then a response team who sit above that. Um, and that's where you would put your legal DP account management, PR and comms, um, you know, HR and so on. Those are the people who that technical team are informing so that the, the team, the response team can make decisions 
on what is our what is our strategic approach to this incident. Um, and then finally, you have a, the external group who are brought in, which, as you mentioned, would include things like forensics, um, external legal advice, external PR, um, and so on. You know, teams with broadcast knowledge, for goodness sake, if it goes to, it goes to kind of the, the national scale. But I think it's the most important thing for me is that you have a consistent approach, um, particularly at the first technical stage, because very often you will find that what you're seeing is something that's a pattern that you've seen the same kind of mistakes being made before. And therefore, if the investigation team is consistent, they can very often mitigate very quickly because they've seen this sort of thing. Um, if it's kind of thrown together again and you haven't been learning your lessons from previous events, the team becomes you know, discontinuous, if that's a word. Um, but but I, I think that, 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 from my point of view, that, that's the importance of, of that, that level. And... Um... It's not a joke, it's reality that it always happens on a Friday. But if it happens on a Friday, um, I'll start with Simon. Do you expect the team to work through the weekend? I'm afraid so, yeah. And it's really based on the reporting deadline of 72 hours from when you become aware. So, uh, and I've had this situation. I've been, you know, um, 100 miles from home from working with a, with a client and the data breach was notified at 10 to 5 on a Friday afternoon. And unfortunately, it turned out to be quite a serious one. So that, that can happen. It's the reality, unfortunately, and mm. really led not just by the reporting deadline, actually, but your responsibility to protect the individuals very much so. Um, so from that point of view, yeah, the team needs to be stood up quickly. Um, you might be lucky and find out, actually, it's not a serious incident, um, but it still needs to be looked at quickly. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm afraid. So there's not getting anywhere. We're not really going to getting around that. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. I've, there's a couple of other good questions that's come in. So um, I'm going to ask Liz this one. What happens if your senior management feel they should be in the initial management team and then only notify the DPO later. So we're saying that the senior management team deal with it and don't involve the DPO. Yep. So DPO learns second hand. Um, what can you do? You were in that situation. You just have to deal with it when it comes to you. And then from then on, look at what happens next time because you can't change what's happened the first time, but you can learn lessons from it and agree the structure for the next time it should it happen. Yeah, okay. And then uh, there's another one here, David. Um, w w how do you manage situations, and we're seeing many more of these, where you're the controller, but you're learning about breaches that are hitting your processors and your sub-processors, mm -hmm. but it still is your problem. How do you manage that scenario? Um, well, it's twofold. There, there's, there's the technical side and there's the contractual side. Um, and one of the critical pieces is to uh, look at your contracts and make sure that they cover uh, events of incidents and data breaches and they require a commitment from your processors to actually be open and transparent um, and give you the information you need. Um, having worked as both a controller or processor in the past, um, both sides win if it's followed. Um, informing your controller when you have a problem and keeping them informed stops panic. Um, as a controller, knowing that you may have an incident and knowing that the, the processor is doing the right thing enables you to start to stand up all of the um, the re response teams in advance of the weakness. So I think that it, it, that, that on the, the contractual side is really important. In a technical side, um, it is always difficult. Um, but as a controller, you should always retain the right to audit. Um, so there should always be in your contract with the processor the right to audit their systems. And if you believe that an incident or a breach has occurred and that you don't feel that they have been giving you as clear and transparent a response as you think you need, you should invoke that right to audit um, and go in and start to look at what their processes look like, how they dealt with incidents, how they've dealt with them in the past. It becomes murkier when it's a sub-processor, sub-processor, sub-processor. 
but as a controller normally you will only have the contractual agreement with your first level processor and those are the people you will have to work with in order to get that sorted yeah that, and, and again from my point of view as the, as the lawyer i am seeing a lot more due diligence now being done by a controller on another controller or by a controller on a processor and yes. one of the questions is can you please tell us have you suffered any notifiable data mm -hmm. breaches or other data incidents and i think it's a, it's an absolutely appropriate question and yes. also, as you say the contracts need to be kept under review because when it does go wrong and i've recently had several where the breach was with our processor when you notify the irish commissioner or the uk ico one of the questions will, you will be asked is can we please see the contract hmm. and it, it is pretty embarrassing when you don't have something that is up to date yeah. correct etc etc um how, how do you liz manage that processor relationship when they have the breach but you need to know about it because it you know whose decision is it to tell the ICO for example good question Robert thank you for that one <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you need to be doing your due diligence in the front end um, and asking those questions at the front end and I also think you need to be doing it at your review points with them so you've got an open and transparent relationship with your processors throughout the relationship and the longevity of the relationship at the end of the day if they're not delivering their, delivering their contractual arrangement do you need to continue with that processor that's that's what I would be yeah. looking at yep yep and, and Simon, suppose your processor has said, w we have got a, a situation, but we don't yet know if it's impacted your data. Mm -hmm. Are you obliged to notify the ICO? How long, how long can you sit on that knowledge before you do something? that's that's quite a common situation in my experience actually because the uh, processor or in fact a processor's processor as Dave said we can have quite long supply chains nowadays where there's a processor of a processor etc and until they have identified exactly one whether personal data has been affected and if it has which clients has it affected and I've seen a situation like this where actually as a working with a controller we've been asking the processor to confirm has our data been affected and certainly didn't hear in the first, you know, 72 hours. In fact, it took weeks for them to be able to identify that and confirm it. Um, so a judgment call had to be made whether to whether to report that to the ICO. And, and our decision was, no, we have not been told. We've been told about a potential breach. And as Dave said, it's a security risk from our point of view. We, we've, we don't know our data's involved. We haven't had that confirmed. So in that situation, we chose not to report it because we weren't sure our data was involved. I'm quite interested what your thoughts are on that situation, Dave, because I'm sure you've had very similar situations too. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I mean, as I say, from both the processor and the controller side, um, as a processor, I think it's important that, that when, you, when you've first seen an incident, you look at that, you decide whether or not you think that there is a reasonable potential that it's going to turn into a data breach. Um, you should also be looking at you know for, unless all data is congealed do you know roughly which customers clients may have been affected tell them at that point you go back to that you, you go back to your contact at that organization and say we have an incident we don't have a breach yet we have an incident we're investing investigating the incident there is a possibility that you may have some data involved we will keep you informed at whatever given interval works for the two companies um, because that way the controller feels confident that they're being given honest and clear information they can respond to and they don't have to start their clock ticking because they have not been informed there's a breach and that again for me is essential and it's something which so many companies get wrong they talk to each other on emails and on instant messaging and in conversations on video conferences we've got a breach we've got a breach it's a problem it's a problem when they don't know that and as soon as they use that phrase the clock starts so one takeaway for everybody get it into your culture 
that you talk about an incident always until you have an absolute proven breach. It will save you so much, so much grief. Mm. And, and I guess if, if you do notify, um, my understanding is the ICO does not welcome over notification. Is that fair to say, Liz? Yeah, we had an example of that. Was it last year or the year before? Um, if I recall exactly that situation, somebody notified when they didn't need to and it, it wasn't welcomed. And I think from the ICO's perspective, it kind of leads to the fact that maybe you're not as in control or you don't know your eggs as well as you should know your eggs. So, um, you know, be careful what you do. Yeah. And, and, and what do you... Th I what do you suggest, Simon, the company should be double checking if they've made the decision to notify? What should they be sure they've got in place to answer the questions that they're bound to get? Well, I think the first thing, I guess, is, is making sure that you notify purely based on fact. I think that's a key thing. Um, be careful of making any assumptions and try to avoid any assumptions in that in that reporting uh, and that notification to the the ICO you know supervisory authority. Be careful on that. Um, equally, um, make sure that you've got the logs, you've got the information to back that up. Um, just get yourself prepared for any questions that might come out of it because you you need to be prepared that when it's reported, again depending on the, the level of seriousness, uh, you know the severity of the breach, you may well get a stream of questions back. So make sure that you're preparing yourself, and you should be doing that immediately as soon as the breach is you know is notified. So it's important when a you know if you've got it through the reporting process that you're keeping copies of all of that information and not losing the evidence trail at any stage. Uh, and. How practically do you decide when an incident is reportable? In other words, that it's going to cause significant harm. Is it based on volume or is it based on sensitivity of the data or is it all or any of those? What do you think, Simon? Should I set that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's based kind of on both. Uh, it will be a combination. Most organisations will do a um, will do an assessment that's based on yes, the volume, but also the level of sensitivity, and therefore what the impact of that could be on the individual. What kind of the what would the harms look like to the individual as well, uh, whose data has been breached. Um, so that's what you'd look at. I mean, many organizations will use kind of a matrix or a grid, like a four by four kind of risk grid that plots kind of the volume against the sensitivity so that they've got some benchmarkable process to compare mm -hmm. one breach against another breach to identify whether it meets that threshold really for for reporting. Um, so just to make sure that you've, you've identified whether it meets the reporting threshold for your, for your ICO. Equally, you need to be able to identify for individuals um, as to whether it's got a high risk for the individual. And that's when you'd want to notify individuals. Um, so, again, being cognizant of what kind of, you know, understanding what the, what the harms are for individuals, um, which is a factor of the, vol you know, the volume and the sensitivity mm. of that and the particularly you know, so you'd consider, for example, in that whether uh, whether the status of the individual uh, could affect that. So, uh, for example, are they people in very specific occupation? Like you mentioned the military, for example, Robert, things like that. Are they well-known people? What, what kind of harms could it be for those individuals? And that would affect, again, whether you notify those individuals, things like that. Along with, again, all sorts of, you know, the sensitivity of that data and, and what kind of volume and harm it could cause. And then I suppose you've also got to bear in mind that the moment you notify the individuals, you've told them we've lost control of your data. Yeah. And then you're going to be subject to the no win, no fee type class action claims. I mean, I think that's another one that worries me about over notifying. Yeah, but, who's that for, that, Robert? I well, agree. No, that was just... <laughs> That was just generally making a comment because I was going to say, do you find, David, that when you have gone through the assessment of risk, notifiability, et cetera, where do you keep the record? Do you think it's, is that something you keep within the CISO role or does it go in the ROPA? Where, where do you keep this? Um, in, in, in my experience, it's normally been held uh, within the CISO domain. 
Um, and typically, it can be done either just, just through a policy and a process or through a workflow tool. Um, so I've worked in, in organizations where um, we had an, a, a war room when something happened and we had five or six whiteboards around the room and then we had someone simply scribing everything that happened as it went along. Um, I've also worked with you know organizations using tools as big as things like ServiceNow, which absolutely gorgeous if you have incredibly deep pockets, but you can, you, you can run those kind of investigation and it will record the timing of everything that happens that, that goes along. Um, typically keeping it in uh, underneath the security team uh, makes sense um, because that they, they are the people who are trained to make sure that it doesn't get um, to be honest manipulated um, but it can equally sit within DPO um, if the DPO are the people who are within the organization are going to have to do the reporting they may well say you know I want this held I want to be able to control this myself so it, it's not totally essential but I would say Unless it's going to a head of legal, it should always be in CISO or, or DPO roles. Okay. And Liz, any? No, I agree with David questions? totally there. Um, that's where I would be looking to keep it as well. Back to who's got ownership of the program here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I know you have just have got stats, but I think it, could you just remind us, David? What's your understanding of the the stats around the types of breaches? You know, everybody's talking at the moment about ransom this and cyber that, but what proportion proportionally are the external threats and what are internal? Um, well, it, that's interesting. I mean, the the the, the last set of stats that I saw just, just uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about the types of attacks uh, that companies are seeing they, they say typically just over 30 just over a third of all attacks are coming from a vulnerability that's a hacker attacking and breaking through um, around about 60% um, come from credentials and individuals being fished so it's malicious emails it's phishing it's credential theft um, so really very, very small coming from any other sources. So the majority is actually coming from individuals. Um, credential theft is an interesting one. It normally means that a password has been compromised, typically because it's been used by someone elsewhere. Um, so um, that's now becoming very common. And 74%, um, according to the Verison recent report, are down to human error and human malice. 50% um, of the social engineering attacks are coming from business email compromise. That's an attacker spoofing your addresses, breaking into your conversations. Um, I think probably the, the, the other one which I find really interesting is people talk about cyber insurance. Is it worth, is it, worth it? The statistics would suggest in, in cyber, with cyber insurance, if you attack with ransomware, 98% of the time you're going to recover the data. Um, it's closer to 80% if you don't have the insurance. Uh, so if you can afford it, cyber insurance really does work. One of the benefits of that is it forces you to do the right thing because it won't insure you unless they're checking you're doing the right thing. Um, and I think probably the final thing is for people to understand the, the business impact, not merely the personal data. If you're attacked effectively, recovery times, less than 50% of companies are back and running within a week less than 50 percent um 30 percent take up to the end of the month before they're up again so there is a percentage 10 15 percent who can go well beyond a month that normally comes because you've been attacked effectively and you haven't done the right things in terms of backups off-site storage maintaining your systems so um this is this is very prevalent the uk industry wide 44 percent of all uk organizations surveyed said they had suffered a breach in the last 12 months. So 75% um, um, doesn't surprise me at all. The 44% are people who admit that they have been breached when asked and people who know that they've been breached when asked. So I think 75% is a pretty good estimate for the number of attacks and breaches that people are seeing. Okay, thank you. I'm going to put this one back to, to Liz. So uh, in my experience, 
experience, when things do go wrong, one of the questions that the ICO will ask is, can we see evidence of your training? Do you, how, often, how often should you be training? Should you be using third parties to probe employees' awareness over phishing and social engineering and so on? I don't think you can ever do enough training. Um, and this is where the fun bit for me comes in. It's getting people on board. It's talking people's language. Yes, we need to show that we have done um, our annual training, but our annual training is different for everybody. We've already said there's differences between our marketing team and our HR teams. They need to know the difference, what it means to them, what data protection means to them. Do it in a fun way. Have some awareness campaigns. Have some workshops. It's the drip, drip, drip effect. Have some competitions with a bar of chocolate as the prize. Get people involved. Talking to our teams about the articles and recitals. That might excite us as professionals in this, but that's not going to excite the majority of the people around us so get some campaigns going get some fun get some energy i've had um, a naughty elf selling data to the easter bunny you know do some things to make it fun that sticks with people use your intranet do some workshops get some champions going get some energy behind data protection that's when the message will stick I don't think you can do enough. And if you can show the ICO, yes, we've done our annual tick box training, but in January we did this, and in February we picked up on that, and March we did so and so, that's where it comes, that's where it actually comes together for me. That's the fun bit. Yeah. And, and just on the technology, David, there's a question here. Are there resources and tools to help identify sleeper breaches where access has been gained but not yet acted upon? Technically, yes, there are. Um, they will tend to be expensive. They will tend to be very expensive. And to be honest, um, you need to buy new on a repeated basis because by definition, if it hasn't been detected by the tools you've already got, then you need to go and buy another tool to find it um, over and over and over again. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a difficult one to answer. Typically, what is more like more important than a tool is the monitoring and analysis of user and data behavior. Um, UBA and DBA tools are becoming more and more common. Um, some of them come out of the box with Microsoft, for example, have a range of tools which you can use. Um, some others relatively low cost. Being able to see when someone's account activity suddenly changes, yeah. when data is being sent by an individual at an odd time to an odd location. Those sorts of things are the biggest and best indicators rather than spending a very large amount of money on a tool which may or may not be the magic bullet for that particular attack. And, and just one more question. We've obviously talked, as I would have expected, about breaches of a digital nature, but Simon, we mustn't forget that some of the breaches will be because of poor handling of manual data. Yeah, absolutely. That that can still happen. Um, maybe not happening quite so frequently nowadays, but yeah, so with, with paper copies or other physical copies of data, um, we still need to remember that. Particularly, I think the one that is is what people do with kind of old records that they still want to archive and they still want to keep that they... I've, I've come across one actually where, where an organisation had just simply left, you know, records in a room. You know, that can happen expecting that it was going to be locked all the time. That that can happen, yeah. things like that. Um, so those types of situations. Um, so we do need to remember our physical records are still potentially going to be accessible. So making sure that we've locked cabinets, locked rooms, all of those kind of things yeah. uh, are always going to be important. Yeah. So we've got we've got five minutes to go. Um, I'm just going to go round and say, and I'll start with Liz first. Any any takeaways, any last minute comments? Yes, I would say assess where you are. Know your position with regards to your data, data breaches. Do a readiness assessment. Where are you? Are you prepared if it's Christmas Eve, if it's half past four on a Friday? Do you know what you need to do in the event of a breach? Thank you. Have a plan. 
Be okay, David. Um, I'll go on the technical side of it. Um, I think learn to do the basics right. Do the boring stuff. Make sure your housekeeping is correct. Make sure your joiners and movers and your levers are handled properly. Make sure that you're putting multi-factor authentication on your accounts to kill so many of those internals. Um, those sorts of things really don't cost you very much at all, but have an enormous impact. The second thing is have a good business continuity plan because responding to an instance and events um, really should be part of your business continuity um, and that should be built in. Um, and finally, develop that culture, which has been talked about so much. Get people aware, make training that you're giving them personal. Talk about how they can protect themselves and their families at the same time you talk about protecting the company yeah. and it will resonate. Um, don't treat it as a tick box exactly as, as has previously been said. It's not a tick box exercise. That doesn't protect you. It might look good, but it's not going to protect you. Yeah. And, and as I say, from, from my point of view, when I've had the ICO into the building saying, how could this happen, etc., to have been able to say, look, here is our manual, here's our policies, here's our training programs. We did everything we can, but you can't, you know, you can't prevent somebody being an idiot and sending the right attachment to the wrong recipients, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is we're not happy with what happened, but at least we can see you were trying to do the right thing. You know, doing nothing obviously is not the answer here. You've got to have all your ducks in a row. With that, I'm going to hand back to Simon for your final comments and then closing us out. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thanks, uh, thanks, Liz. And thanks, David, as well, for your, your comments on today. Sure. It's, been, it's terrific. Um, I think I'd, I'd echo both of the things that you said of a kind of around the, the training awareness side, but also making sure the technical measures. And quite often when we, we work with organisations and looking at, we, we you can find that, that some of the more basic things, like Dave mentioned, like multi-factor authentication, uh, making sure that you've regularly reviewed your access controls, all, some of those basics. And equally, the other one is sharing data within an organization by email and expecting it's going to be secure. Things that are just uh, covering your basics is always going to be important. Um, and then just making sure that you have considered have we got everything in place to be able to respond quickly, which is appointing your response team, having a process or a playbook that you can follow quickly uh, and knowing uh, how you'll make that decision about when to report to the uh, your supervisor authority or to notify individuals. Just putting all those steps in place that hopefully we've, we've helped you with today. So um, thanks, everyone. I hope you found it uh, found it useful. Um, also, I'd like to thank everyone that's uh, that's put questions in the chat. I've seen quite a few of those. And also lots of people have put little links and things for each other. So it's always nice to see that. Thank, thank you all very much. I uh, hope you all found it found it really useful. Um, so we'll, we'll close there. We're just coming up to the hour. So uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.